In today's episode of The Insect Hunter, I'm going to teach you how to rear stick insects so that you'll be able to raise them all year round. So before I get into the rearing, I want to talk to you about the species that I've got here and a little bit about their biology. So let's go ahead and pull those out. All right, so up here on top, we've got a little baby uh, pink winged stick insect, and then we've got an older, getting close to adulthood, giant prickly stick insect. So let's go ahead and pull him off. Let's get these guys out. I'll hold you over here. There you go. There's one of them. And let's get a... Uh, Let's get a bigger, I'll try and get a full grown one here. It looks like we got one right here. Pink winged stick insect, here you go, baby. Come on out, okay. There we go, he might climb up my arm. All right, now that I've got these guys out, let's talk about them one at a time. I'll actually probably just put you up on my shoulder, buddy. We'll talk about the other one first. Here you go, hey, come on. There you go, he'll probably climb over somewhere else. Anyways, this species here, this is a pink winged stick insect. And these guys are a very elongate uh, stick insect. And uh, the reason they call them a pink winged stick insect is that if we can get him to show his wings here, you'll see that they're pink. So I'm gonna try and hold him up in here so he can't really grab and move away. So here we go. There's his wings right there. There we go. There you can see the wing. It looks like he may have gotten in close proximity with another stick insect and it's kind of chewed a hole in his wing. But anyways, they do have wings, um, so that's why they're called a pink winged stick insect. Only the, the adults will have wings. But anyways, um, this one is a female. And I'm not even sure if there's a difference between the males and the females. I've only raised asexually reproduced um, females, so there could be a difference, but I'm not sure. And these guys, they really remind me of their faces. They look like those aliens off of Men in Black, those little aliens. I mean, I'm pretty certain that those aliens, their faces were based off of these guys because they just have that type of a face. These guys are uh, not a super active species. They're pretty, um, they're pretty chill. They will move around and run around some, but they're pretty chill. Most of the time, they're just sitting still trying to pretend to be a stick, so... They're not as active and as exciting as the giant prickly stick insect over here that I've got. So we'll go ahead and we'll put him on our shoulder. Let him come over here. All right. This guy over here, and we'll see if he's going to climb on my face. I guess he does. He does. Pull a little insect house for you guys. Um, this guy here is a giant prickly stick insect. And this guy, as you can see, is much more active. The first time I saw it, I almost thought it was like a toy because it almost moves like a toy or mechanically. It looks almost like a robot or something. Um, so they're pretty interesting. I guess he can tell I didn't shave, so he's getting some real good grips on there. And both of these species are, um, they use camouflage to try and keep themselves hidden from predators in the wild. I believe the giant prickly stick insect is from Australia, and I think the pink winged stick insects, I think they're from uh, somewhere in Asia, I believe. They're not native here to the United States. But the giant prickly stick insect to me is much cooler. It's much more threatening. It's cool looking. It likes to do kind of this threat pose. If it feels threatened, it will raise its tail up almost like a scorpion. And then it also just has all these spikes and spines all over it, so it'd be difficult to eat, um, or at least unpleasant to eat, I'd say. Um, for something. This one's not fully grown. This one probably has one or two more instars before it's a full grown female, uh, but it is a female and uh, she'll get quite big and so they're pretty pretty neat. I really like them. This is starting to kind of tickle so I I think I'm going to pull him off there. He's kind of starting to tickle my my chin a little. <laughs> Anyways, both of these species are asexual and they will pre-produce on their own. They can um, just lay eggs and they'll basically make clones of themselves, which will just be females. But there are males as well. The males of the giant prickly stick insect look different. This is what they look like. And the males will fly. And uh, the males are pretty interesting. I just don't have any right now because I've only been able to um, raise some asexually reproduced eggs. So anyways, they're both pretty cool. Um, they both eat plants um, in the wild. I believe they eat a lot of eucalyptus. And we'll kind of talk about the food that they eat when we get into the rearing. 
if you guys will be nice, I'll put you on my shoulder, because um, that's fine with me, but I just don't want you all over my chin. It's kind of ticklish. It's tickling me a little. So anyways, I'll just let you stay here. That's okay. The first thing that you want to do if you're going to plan on rearing some stick insects, if you're in the United States, is you need to get a permit. You have to have a special permit because these do feed on plants and they're not native to the U.S. So you need to have a permit and you can watch the video that pops up up here to learn how to get that permit. After you've got a permit, if you're in the United States, you need to think about a cage. There's a couple options you can do for cages. The cage that I have here, which I really like this cage, it's called a Zoomed Creatures and it has this nice lid on it and the lids may vary depending on which model you have but it's got a nice lid to keep them contained you want to have some way to contain them and keep them in and then the whole thing is glass on the sides and it um, you could technically use this as like uh, an aquarium but it's called the Zoo Med Creatures I really like this one when you're looking at a cage you want to have some height because you want to have some height for your leaves to be in there and have some space of leaves um, to be in there. So it also gives them some area for climbing. This is probably a small enclosure compared to what most people would do. So I can't rear a ton of them in here. Um, with the space I have, um, I usually raise about 10 to 20 in here, which is probably actually overcrowding. Um, I try to keep it at about 10 stick insects. Um, with these guys, one of these guys, once they get fully grown, will eat probably two or three times as much as this guy back here on my shoulder. So you wanna keep that in mind of how many are you trying to rear. I probably will get a bigger one eventually, but at this time, this is just the easiest thing for me to use. You also want to have glass or some means of the sunlight getting in. You don't want it to be all dark because you want those plants to stay alive as long as possible. So if sunlight can get in there, it's gonna be more likely that they'll actually stay alive. And you most definitely need a cover like this one to keep them from escaping. You don't want them to escape. So you do want some airflow, but you don't want too much because you want to have a little bit of humidity in there. If you're getting stick insects, I would say that you want two cages. You want to have one cage um, in order, oh, he just flew back on my uh, chair back there. Yeah, come here, dude. He just wants to fly away. I might have to put you back. I think he's going back in the cage for now. At least she is, it's actually a female, but anyways. There you go, back to your leaves. If you're gonna do stick insects, you need at least two cages. I have two cages, that way then when I'm cleaning this cage out, I can put them into the other one so they've got a cage that they're in at all times because I don't want them escaping and getting out. I also have another cage, which is a kind of a cage within a cage. So when I'm traveling, I can take a couple of them with me without them escaping and getting away. So you could use these to transport them and put this in like a cooler or something, as long as it's pretty stable. This could actually work for transporting them to an educational event or something if you're going to be driving around with them. Another option for cages is a pop-up rearing cage. I really like this idea because you could just put a potted plant in there. And I tried that for a while and it actually did work pretty well. Um, it's a way to keep a plant in there alive and you can kind of rear them inside of that. But the downside to that cage is that it's not going to hold in the humidity quite as well as this one. And you really have to water that thing like crazy um, and just give it a lot of misting and stuff so they can get a drink because it will just dry out very quickly if you're in a desert type place like I am. So that's one disadvantage, but it's a lot bigger and it probably was about the same price is one of these in all honesty. So the most important thing and the greatest challenge you will have with stick insects is food, getting them enough food and keeping them fed because they will eat a lot and trying to get plants like this during the winter is a challenge. So I'm gonna break up feeding them into two sections, the summer food, summer feeding, and then winter feeding if you're in a colder climate. During the summer, feeding these guys is a piece of cake. I can do that like because there's plants that grow here in people's gardens that I can just go harvest whenever I want. So I'll go out to a guy's place, but I'll just go and I'll trim some blackberry leaves. And then I put those into, uh, we'll see if I can pull this out without letting too many of them escape. I'm trying not to have any major escapes today. I'll put you back in there. So what I do is I take a yogurt type container 
and then I will cut a hole in the lid and then I will stuff blackberry plants in it or whatever kind of plant I have and then I keep watering this plant to make sure that the plant stays alive and then usually the plant if it's a good plant will last um, two or three weeks in there and then they just get to feed off of this and if you look right here at this leaf you can see there's been quite a bit of um, quite a bit of feeding going on they've just really been going to town on that leaf so anyways that's kind of how you give them the food and you want to keep that food alive and well watered and I also put it out in the sun so that it gets some sunlight for photosynthesis so it doesn't just die instantly this one is a baby that was just born like a day ago so anyways some people would say don't handle it with your hand but if it's walking on me then it's fine as long as it's the one kind of initiating the movement I don't really mind handling the small ones you could use forceps just to be careful and safe but if they're walking around I just let them walk on me now I want to give you a list of my favorite food recommendations for them and then I'll share some that I haven't tried but I've heard work my first number one food that I like to feed them is blackberry plants those will last for about two weeks in here which is awesome just have to water it a little bit and the nice thing about blackberries is that they will live um, later into the season. They'll stay alive, you know, if they're growing in someone's garden. I can still go harvest them into late October or November um, here in the part of Idaho I'm in. In other parts of Idaho, you can harvest them all year round. So that's why I like blackberries so much. They're just a hardier species. And I think um, they're either related to or it's the same thing um, as bramble, which... Maybe the same thing, I'm not sure. I'm not a plant expert, so I'm sure one of you will correct me. My second favorite food to feed them is raspberry plants, which the raspberries and blackberries, it seems like they get the same amount of nourishment from. It's just that with the blackberries, they last longer into the winter, um, but you can use either one interchangeably. They work really well. Both of them will last two weeks. My next favorite food to feed them is roses. You can actually get just about any type of rose trim the leaves, make some cuttings, um, put that into here. Anytime you're putting leaves and things into here, put the whole stem, it will last so much longer. Just get the stems, put them into water so that they'll last longer. The one issue I have with roses, it seems like they like them, but the issue with roses is that a lot of people will put pesticides on them or they will use systemic pesticides, which are pesticides that are put in the ground and then the roots absorb them and then they get into the leaves so that it will actually kill insects or things feeding on them because most of the time you know people are not going to be eating roses i know there's some people that do or use it for medicinal purposes but most of the time people aren't eating it so they don't care if it absorbs pesticides inside of it so if it has absorbed those pesticides it can kill them um, last year when i was getting close to the winter i had some giant prickly stick insects and I needed some food, so I got desperate. So I went to a floral shop and I said, do you guys have any uh, rose leaves that I could have? Do you have some stems that are kind of older or you're not going to sell? I got them, I put them in with them, and they started feeding on them immediately. But my insects died because there must have been some sort of pesticides either on them or inside of them. I think I washed them off, so it probably had a systemic pesticide. So that's the issue with roses is you've got to know whether it has pesticides on it or in it which can be a challenge in and of itself. So that one does work as a good food, but you have to do a little more research. Um, and it could happen with the raspberries or blackberries. It just depends on whoever's growing the plants, whether it's you or someone else. Make sure you know whether there's pesticides on those before you start feeding it to them. My next food that I really like, uh, it's probably the last one that I'll share, is oak leaves. Um, oak leaves, the good thing about this is that they'll just produce so many leaves. If you have an oak tree, you can get almost an infinite supply of um, oak leaves. The issue that I've had with this is the time that I've tried to use it, it doesn't seem like it lasts as long as the raspberry plants. Um, cutting off those branches, they don't last quite as long as raspberries, roses, or blackberries. So you're going to have to be switching out those leaves more frequently. So it's a bit more of a challenge, but they will eat it. Other plants that I've heard that will work is hazel and eucalyptus. I don't have access to those, so I've never tried it. But if I was going to try and do some new plants, what I would do, if you have two cages, you know, keep feeding um, the insects in one cage, something you know that will work, one of the ones that I've recommended. And then take maybe two or three, maybe just one or two of your stick insects, move them in a different cage, and in that other cage, put the other plant and see if they survive. It's kind of like experimenting, you know, try a new plant, see if it works. 
Um, that way then you're not killing your whole colony if you're going to try and do that. So that's one option for trying out new things. So now the real challenge and the hardest thing that I've found about stick insects is getting them food during the winter. Here in Idaho, everything shuts down. It's snow, it's ice. There's not a lot of plants that are alive other than basically pine trees. So you have to really think about what's going to be your strategy. One strategy you can do is you can feed them romaine lettuce. I would go and get organic romaine lettuce and I'd feed that to them. The pink winged stick insects did really well with it and they were fine. They still kept producing eggs. But the giant prickly stick insects struggled and it didn't work super well. Other people have recommended that you can actually take raspberry or blackberry plants and freeze those and try to feed it to them. I've tried that and it didn't work very well for me. Maybe I did something wrong with the freezing or I froze them for too long, but it didn't seem like they even wanted to feed on it and they just kind of wilted very quickly. It all depends on the species you have. The best thing to do, which is what I'm working on right now, is I'm growing some plants outside. I've got this blackberry bush growing in a pot and I'm actually going to put that in a greenhouse. I've got some friends that are going to let me put it in their greenhouse and keep it alive and uh, hopefully I'll just be able to go and get some small clippings and keep my colony alive throughout the winter just so I have a couple I could take around to schools if I have an educational event or just have some alive in general. But really during the winter I'm probably going to cut down my colony depending on how much food I have in that greenhouse. If I've got very limited food I might keep one giant prickly stick insect and then maybe two um, of the pink winged stick insects. Just cut it down as small as I can to try and make it through the winter because during the summer I have enough food to raise thousands and hundreds of thousands of these things because getting these clippings is a piece of cake. But during the winter that's a challenge. I did also try you know raising some raspberry plants just inside of a window um, in a building where it's warm and it kind of worked, but I had so many issues with mites, it just didn't work very well. So I'm gonna try this greenhouse thing. I think that's the best way to go if you can find someone with a greenhouse. So I'm taking care of the plants during the summer. Once we hit that winter, those colder months, throw them in the greenhouse, we'll keep them alive. I'll go and get clippings every couple weeks and uh, we should be good. So that's my plan. If you're gonna do the romaine lettuce, I wanna share a couple tips. First off, make sure it's organic. And then if you get the chance, check your local grocery stores and look for romaine lettuce that has expired. And I'm sure somebody's going to say, well, that doesn't have the best nourishment. But most of the time, you know, these guys aren't very picky about the color. There's still nourishment in there for them. So I would actually look and I'd find romaine lettuce that had expired and I'd feed that to them and I'd got like a super big discount or I'd even get it for free because it was just expired. So that's another option for you during the winter. But you've got to have something or else they're just going to die. All right, so now let's talk about moisture. The first thing is you wanna keep your plant well watered, keep that watered, and they should get some moisture from the plants, but you also want to do some occasional spritz of water. So I'll just take a spray bottle and just spray it a little bit, um, give them a little bit of extra water and moisture. Every couple days I do that. Another thing you wanna do is avoid drowning. So with my container here, I do that by cutting a hole in this yogurt container and then I will stuff plants into here as tightly as I can so it's hard for them to actually get access here into the water and then I just water with like a turkey baster. I'll put water into here and keep it watered but that at least keeps them from getting in there. You could also put like tin foil on this or something to kind of hold it in and maybe that would retain the moisture better but I'm just too lazy. I'd rather just water it every couple days or once a week. Another important thing to do because this can get messy as you can see there's a lot of poop and waste in here. This has only been cleaned a couple days ago. Um, it'll build up a lot of waste and especially if you're adding a lot of moisture it could get kind of moldy. So you want to keep some good ventilation but you want to clean it about once every two weeks. I usually clean it as soon as the plants have kind of died off and I need to switch out the plants. So I just base that off of my plants that I've got in there which usually last two weeks. So then you can clean it out. I always like to put like a paper towel or something on the bottom just to make it easier to clean. It just makes the process more simple. When I'm cleaning this, anything that I pull out, I put into a Ziploc bag and then I freeze it. That way then in case I miss any eggs, those get killed so they're not going to be hatching somewhere else or escaping. So while you are cleaning out your container, you want to look for eggs so that you can harvest those so that you can raise a new generation of stick insects eventually. It's a lot easier to separate them from this group and to kind of control the eggs separately because they need more moisture and more humidity than the adults do. 
So for the pink winged stick insects, this is what their eggs look like. Let's see if you can see those there. Anyways, their eggs look much more long and narrow. They're these long eggs. And if you look at this egg right here, I think it's just about to hatch. Um, it's starting to get bright green. So that one's probably going to hatch here soon. But anyways, those are the pink winged stick insects. Just have them in this container and I missed it about um, once every week or two. I'll miss this. And then I put something on top of it to kind of hold the humidity in. You don't want it too moist, um, but you do want it to have a tiny bit of airflow, I'd say. So I just put something on top so it gets a little airflow. Um, for the giant prickly stick insects, I don't have any of those eggs right now. Um, this is what they look like, a little bit more round, and they have kind of this little bump nub thing on the end, which is kind of cool. And I will just throw them in here with the pink wing stick insect eggs, and the same thing, just misting it. Got it, a paper towel in there to hold some of the moisture. Just keep misting it every couple weeks. And then it takes a varying amount of time. You know, it can take anywhere from three to four months to six to eight months. Um, with the giant prickly stick insects, they're amount of time before they will hatch is much longer. It's taken a lot longer to get those to um, kind of hatch out. When you're looking for the pink winged stick insects eggs, they will actually glue those on the sides of the glass or on plants and things like that. For the giant prickly stick insects, you'll just look on the bottom and they'll be all over the place in the poop and stuff. So you just got to kind of fish them out little by little and then just throw them in here. But the key thing that I do with the eggs is if you're unable to keep them alive during the winter, you don't have enough food, you want to make sure you harvest as many eggs as you can in the fall. So especially in those later months, you know, October, um, when it's starting to get cold, you want to make sure you're harvesting as many eggs as you can and getting them in here and taking care of them. That way then when you hit the spring of the next year, you've got a new group hatching. So you've got a colony ready to go so you can be feeding and taking care of um, during the next year. And as the colony grows, if it gets too big and it looks like I've got too many insects to deal with, I will cut down on the colony. I'll usually try and take one of the older adults that has already been producing a ton of eggs because they're just getting older and I'll usually pull them out and uh, just throw them in the freezer and then they'll be euthanized. You just got to leave them in there for a couple days. You have to have a colony that is sustainable because if I had you know 30 or 40 stick insects in here there's not going to be enough food and it's going to be too crowded and they will actually start kind of biting and chewing on each other. I don't know that it's called cannibalization, but they will start feeding and chewing and attacking each other. I've seen that happen when they're in a really tight space. So you want to pick an amount that's going to be good for you. So to wrap up, I just want to talk a little bit about how do you actually get stick insects? How do you get some if you want some and you don't know where to find them? Well, once you have your permit, then you can start looking around to see who has them. So the best tip I can give you is to go to a reptile show or look for like a local um, pets or like reptiles or like tarantulas, Facebook group or something in your local area and uh, go to them because they will give you an affordable price and you'll be able to get some from them. If you wanna get some and you can't find a group, you're gonna have to try and order online. And I was really surprised that these giant prickly stick insects, like, I mean, seriously, these guys, once you've figured out how to raise these guys, they're not that expensive to raise, but to order them online is like 50 bucks. I've seen 50 bucks. I've seen some for like 30. I've even seen some sold for about a hundred bucks, depending on the age. And then you're going to have to pay a, a huge amount of shipping. So I would not order online unless you have no options because at least in the United States, they'd be quite expensive. If you're in Australia, you might be able to go find some out in the wild. I don't know. Um, but I would not recommend ordering online. If you can find local groups or people that are raising them, you could get access to some, and that's going to be a much better option for you because they're going to charge you an affordable price. You know, you got to find someone at a local reptile show or someone that's raising them. Just ask around and get to know people, and you should be able to find stick insects or other exotic pets that you could get legally with a permit. So I'd look around for sure. So I've raised these for over a year now and I've gone through three different generations and it's been a lot of fun. You know, the only frustrating thing is those plants. Trying to keep the plants and the food for them is a challenge during the winter. So think about that really hard. So what insect do you guys think I should get next as a pet for here in my office? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and click that bell so you'll stay notified of all the new videos coming from the Insect Hunter where big adventures start small. Thanks for watching.